those crimes and how they affect the security. Here is uh, Ria Ria, our independent expert. Looking forward to your solutions and stories, I'm going to speak about why a hacker would need the Mona Lisa. Hopefully we'll learn why. Let me first introduce myself, since we're in this distinguished audience. A couple words about myself. When I was thinking about how to present myself, I came up with four words. Design, OSINT, Art and Love. I've been a product designer for 12 years now. I work at a major cybersecurity company now, and uh, another large part of my life is OSINT, open source intelligence, where you use open data to find something that you need. My love for OSINT guided me into such area as art crime. I now specialize in it, too. In a few minutes, we'll learn what that is. You might have heard it for the first time now, but don't worry. We'll uh, learn all about it. I'll be speaking about art, of course, with myself. Art and technology. In the slide, you can see a lot of sensors that are used in uh, real-life museums to protect the paintings. Here is the definition. Art crime is any investigation related to crimes in the art world. Let's see what you know about it. Has anybody heard of uh, major heists? carried out at museums or art galleries. Well, what a cultured audience. Really glad to see a lot of hands up. That is true. The statistics by Interpol show us that the annual rate of art theft amounts to 8.5 billion dollars. To give you a sense of perspective, it's a large number still, uh, but uh, in relative terms, this is the third largest amount after uh, drug sales and arm trade, arms trade. As for the Mona Lisa, well, it is very expensive, right? Here is the most popular painting that got stolen four times. The whole four times, but it had been recovered each and every time anonymously, but it is still at the museum now. It was returned as a drop in on a bike from nowhere out of the blue, but all four thefts turned out all right. It's in the Guinness record, Book of Records now for this. And it's called also Takeaway Rembrandt. It's a portrait of Jacob the Game. The man in the picture is an artist. He addressed Rembrandt as a friend, asking for a portrait. He gave Rembrandt a large plane of wood, a board of wood, Paints and supplies were quite expensive back then, so Rembrandt cut the board in three. One is on the slide, the other is the friend, and the third part of the board is a self-portrait. Well, nothing went to waste, and it makes perfect sense. This painting has uh, a history behind it. The guy in the painting had a will actually inscribed on the reverse side of the painting. He left this painting to his friend, who was painted on the other part of the board. Fortunately, this guy died actually first, and his friend inherited the picture. It's small, like an A4 sheet of paper, so it's easy to steal. 
сейчас right. мы перейдем к таким более серьезным кейсам. Краткие. Now on to Первое, это more high-profile highs. You all know the face, right? One of the most famous paintings ever, the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. If I were to tell you now that its fame is a newfangled thing, it didn't used to be like that. This can, could surprise you, you would think that I'm going crazy. But if you look at history, in 1911, it was stolen from the Louvre. This was a minor theft, and a visitor who came to see the picture actually reported the crime. There is a photo. And the genius uh, thief of the 20th century is Vincent, Vincent Perugia, shown in the picture. Here is his mugshot. A great man, actually. Let me tell you all about him. He came from Italy. He got employed with Louvre uh, as a handyman. He got a bad mood one day. Got up on the wrong footing. Went to the museum, and then the story is, gets blurry. The guard let him in because he was an employee. Nothing suspicious there. He took the picture off the wall, took it out of the frame, put the frame together with some student pieces near a staircase to make it inconspicuous. He left his fingerprint on the glass, his thumb. He rolled it up. The canvas can be rolled up, right? If you think about it, hypothetically, you were to steal something from a museum. God forbid, it's just a thought experiment. You would most likely roll it up, paint to the inside. But it's actually damaging to the canvas, and you need to do it the other way around. So you roll it up, went out, nice and dandy, went home. Get it in a closet or in a chest, and nobody heard from him about it for two years. Everybody went crazy. There was a shutdown on the France's border. Everybody was mustered to go look for it. It's a very strange case. Nobody had cared for Mona Lisa all that much before, but this was a perfect storm. Nobody suspected Vincenzo. He had an alibi, because he had another job that day. A law-abiding citizen, right? He had stored that painting in his chest for two years. He wrote letters to his father that he was in for a large sum of money, an instant sum of money. Once he got caught, he gave very different reasons for stealing it. He posed patriotically, saying that he wanted to return the painting to its homeland in Italy. Then he began saying that she was like some of his family, someone in his family, other pretexts. So nobody knows why. He was convicted to one year and 15 days. He became a national hero in Italy. He was in for seven months. Still a superstar in Italy. He got out. He had a nice life after. Well, except that he went to war against Austro-Hungary. He got married. He went back to France didn't change his name, got employed again. He could have, got much, could have gotten caught much faster, actually, because there was a fingerprint on the glass pane. But uh, head of the police wasn't as progressive. This was a new thing at the time, and investigation took two years. How did he get caught? He wanted to sell it off, the Uffizio Gallery in Florence. He contacted a friend for this, uh, even if this was a dubious idea from the get-go. But busted for this. 
got uh, arrested. There was a grant tour for the picture, it got exhibited a lot and then returned. It was reported in the media a lot and it was all over the news, all the headlines. The only thing that hijacked the narrative was uh, the sinking of the Titanic. The rest was Mona Lisa. What do we have now in our museums after this story? You cannot even approach it now. It's uh, behind bulletproof glass. I'll get back to this again. It's uh, guarded by a rail, there are guards and uh, motion sensors. If you uh, stand near the painting for too long, a museum official will come up to you and ask about if everything is okay. Out of uh, the 2,000 people employed at Louvre, 1,000 are security. And uh, they don't publish their payroll, but the word on the street is that that's a lot of money not give you an exact figure, unfortunately. The outcome was that the painting was recovered, it got restored after some damage, security was reinforced at the museum, happy end. Let's look at another heist now. The second case is about Edward Monk and his paintings. There is a great quote from one of the sources. You laugh at me, but another monk got stolen in Norway. Just look at his provenance, so to speak. A lot of thefts, very popular among thieves. Is it so boring to live in Norway? Or whatever the reason? Well, the early highs were really spectacular. It was during an Olympics, and it took 50 seconds for the robbers to come in, take the picture, and leave, also leaving a note, thank you for the bad security. They were caught right-handed, uh, the picture was recovered. Then there is a case in 2004, it's a bit more sophisticated. Uh, let's focus on this one. A great picture, actually. He doesn't seem happy that his paintings get stolen all the time. When uh, one of the Madonnas was stolen and one of the versions of Scream was stolen in Norway, because there are different variants, when it, it got stolen, it was actually in the light of day. Armed robbers came in, shouted, it's a robbery, everybody lie down, they snatched the picture and left, rushed away in a car. A passerby was able to take a picture. That's not the actual picture, unfortunately. It's a uh, investigation, recreation. This was all over the media, all across the globe. After the theft, the car was found pretty quickly, abandoned uh, near near some dumpsters where they found the frames as well. And the chatter was that nobody would ever find the pictures. It, the trace was dead, assumingly they were burned. It was an expensive loss for Norway, a major crime. Head of the police uh, had to apologize profusely for letting that happen, because the time for police to arrive to the crime scene seemed to be a bit too long. And then investigation dragged on. A reward was announced or any hints until a raid, a random raid recovered the paintings. Unfortunately, police do not disclose too much about their investigations. They have their own means and techniques. They have different units for that, so it doesn't get publicized. How were they able to find the paintings, uh, who were their informants, and so on? Still, the paintings got recovered. The criminals were sentenced to long prison terms. And it says a payout in small font, but it was $122 million. The driver got sentenced to eight years. The person who carried the paintings got seven years, and another one who 
assisted the robbers with getting their ride, but sentenced to four years. Two more people were acquitted, but this was still a resonant case. It's well known uh, in the art circles. Another happy end. The paintings were found, even if a bit damaged. The screen uh, was damaged uh, by moisture in one of the corners, and uh, the Madonna or Mona Lisa got punctured, actually, in two spots. One of the mining companies in Norway made a huge donation to the museum to restore the paintings and to install better security systems. The people got sentenced, but the organizers remain unknown. It's assumed that this was an organized job. The museum was closed for a year, actually, before its security got improved, and people think that it took them a year to install the security system. Last but not least, here is the saddest story. You'll see why in a moment. The year is 1990, the city is Boston in the U.S. Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, a famous philanthropist in the U.S. who spent a lot of money on paintings, various arts, was a big part of her life. At the end of her life she opened a museum and uh, this is her heritage now. On the night of St. Patrick's Day, you get the hint, right? Two people knocked on the doors of the museum, dressed as policemen, asking to come in, ostensibly investigating a loud noise report. Against all protocols, the guard let them in, even if they weren't allowed to do this. They asked about any other people in the museum, and there were two guards there, Rika Abbott, we'll hear that name again, and the other guy, his colleague, was stepping in for another employee, so it was a random person, basically. The people posing as policemen told Rick Abbott that he looked suspicious. His face might have been in a notice. So he got handcuffed and uh, sat in a corner uh, some, some distance away from the alarm button. Then they announced that it was a robbery. They went to the Dutch room and started cutting out the canvases out of the frames. This is major damage. This deals a blow to the value of the paintings as well. So if you are to steal a painting, just take the frame or roll it up. What did they get? They got a Rembrandt, a Monet, and Nobody ever went to the room where it hung. There are logs from the security system in the museum. Nobody went to that room except Rick Abbott. He was checked and double-checked. He went through the lie detector and he seemed to be clean. A couple of sketches by Dega. The most expensive picture that got snatched was a concert by Velasquez, valued at uh, 500 million US dollars. And then a marine, uh, marine landscape by Velasquez. A unique picture, actually. Different drawings, different paintings by Rembrandt, other objects. And the total value of goods stolen was 500 million dollars. The list of uh, losses was really strange. They got a Chinese wine vase, not that expensive and a bit quirky. But the, the funniest thing here was the golden eagle. It's a helm piece for a flag, for a Napoleon, Napoleon's flag. That's something that you put on the pole. It's not even gold, it's brown, bronze, gilded bronze. Maybe the robbers thought that it was pretty and gold and shiny. So it took 81 minutes, they got their loot, took the guards to the basement, taped them, 
to confine them. They were only found in the morning. Rick Abbott uh, sung Bob Dylan songs to not go mad during the time. And he then recounted that it actually transformed his life because there were just four witnesses to the crime. He himself, two people posing as policemen and his colleague. The colleague uh, became a musician performing at cruise liners, so he doesn't spend uh, much time in America. And Rick Abbott uh, took a lot of uh, psychotherapy after he wrote the book even or started writing a book the first chapter is published online it's quite interesting so the clues to, were there but the investigation led to nothing nobody knows where the paintings are still and the museum still has the empty fray frames it breaks my heart to see this a semblance of hope for recovering the paintings after all. There is a startup in Boston actually that designed an app, AR, an AR app that shows what paintings are missing. Still not recovered. There are a lot of gossips who did that. Maybe Ireland, maybe the Italian mob, but nobody knows for sure. Anonymous tips were given to a museum claiming that they knew where the paintings were, but uh, investigation is still ongoing, nobody knows. Museum offers 10 million US dollars or any useful information in recovering the paintings. If you happen to know anything about them, help the art society to recover them, fill the empty frames. And there is a separate bounty for the eagle 100,000, so it's even more than 10 million. Having reviewed a number of cases, so let's now discuss how you can safeguard the paintings. You wouldn't close the museum. Its original purpose is for people to go in and see it. There are several technical solutions that are being deployed in most museums now to do that. That's... Uh, make the paintings secure and make uh, museum visits more controlled to monitor how people behave in the rooms. The picture to the left is from a museum in Singapore. It's really used there. They have RFID tags on all paintings. They serve different purposes. You cannot just remove a painting. If it's removed from the wall, there is an alarm in the security center. It's really useful for stock taking. You can scan it by hovering your device over. So, in your collection, you can go to the storage room and scan all the paintings. You know, your metro card is RFID as well, by the way. Then you can use microchips and sensors. On, on next to paintings. I mentioned this uh, about Mona Lisa, that's the same thing, basically. And now on to the attacks. If there is a security solution, it can get exploited, right? We are speaking cybersecurity here, so let's address this as well. There are different attacks aimed at RFID tags. They can be exploited, I won't give you too much technical detail. You can use RFID zappers, a small device that uh, just overloads the tag and burns it with electromagnetic radiation. You can use intelligent machine vision, intelligent CCTV. This is all the case with Mona Lisa as well. Then you can use biometric access, and some museums have part of the acquisition rooms closed off, and access control is done biometrically through to retina scans as well. This is already in place in the museums. 
some cameras track motion and try to predict the trajectories of people. You can track statistics as well, what paintings are the more popular where people congregate. There are dedicated standards now that train specialized models for this. I haven't seen any deployments while I was preparing to the speech, but uh, progress has been made. And then you have smart alarms. On top of, of RFID, you can put a sensor next to a painting, and if the painting moves, it sounds an alarm. Sensors are really great, actually. There is a museum in Rybinsk, and it's installed a lot of sensors, actually, like your smart home, but a museum. It's not exactly about security, it is about the microclimate in the museum. If you ever went to a major gallery, it's always cool there, because it's better for the paintings and for their longevity. So, smart systems are really promising in terms of museum conservation. They can be attacked as well in numerous ways, so the surface of attack is plentiful. The most secure way is to put a guard next to the painting, and I took this picture for a reason. That person has a badge, but they are in plain clothes. Policemen are present in museums, but plain clothes. Not everywhere, though. In the Netherlands, they have uh, a private security firm, even if they are in contact with the police. The National London, London Gallery has a huge security department, well, it's very valuable. The mat is actually guarded around its perimeter with city police, because there are a lot of activists there, and recently they have been attacking uh, paintings for their agendas. To hack a person, you can do social engineering or phishing, but I would strongly advise against doing that vis-a-vis -a, -vis a policeman. Here is a great example, I couldn't omit it. It's the Met where there is a community of enthusiasts, gentle cowboys, who volunteer, who are security guards at the museum by day, and by night they do their own art. To the right, it's actually a security guard from a museum. They come together, they share different stories, they exchange art ideas, inspiration. They get a sense of purpose in life through this. Art guards, in all senses of the phrase. I think it's a great example. I mentioned glass a couple of times, and it has three layers, it's really thick. Two layers are laminated so that it doesn't crumble when it got, gets hit. It'll get this web fracturing. The properties are very specific. It's anti-glare, it doesn't crumble so that it doesn't damage the paintings, and it's very expensive, of course, so don't damage the, the glass in museums. It's always a major blow. You can be daring and you can get physical with the glass, that's the vector of attack, but please don't. Another way to secure art is awareness raising. Or warned means forearmed, right? You now know that paintings get stolen, that it's expensive, that it's an issue, a real issue. So, this awareness campaign uh, seems to work. People become more cautious, they keep an open eye for what's going on, they can report something suspicious if need be, because as an attack vector it's uh, popular and you can do a lot to raise awareness. Getting exposed to art is always cool, so that's what I always do and recommend everybody does. To close off, I have a bit of a gift. 
some cutie to take a picture and review these QR codes when you have the time. If you can't go to Louvre in person, you can see it offline, look up the portrait of Napoleon, it's great. The 16th chapel as well really draws you in, it's a whole rabbit hole. And you can see things that are not clearly visible as a tourist because it's always crowded. Here you can look at great art from the comfort of your couch. It has the mat, soul, not sure a lot of people travel there, but it's available online. You can reach out to me as well, any questions you might have. I have a channel online where I share different stories from OSINT and ART and the intersections of the two. My slides will be posted there as well. All the links that I had is QR codes too. If you can stand Telegram, I'm available via mail. Sometimes I check it, I promise. So I'll get back to you if you write me something. Now, in closing, art is timeless, even if it's vulnerable. We've seen that there are a lot of problems faced by the museums. I would like to hope that everything remains fine, people go to see art, get charged positively by the arts, but it's not always the case, unfortunately. Other things happen, but I'm hopeful that art will prevail, all paintings will be recovered, and will stop any potential threats or thefts in the future. With that, thank you.